Hey, remember when I made that Things of Interest video on the Donkey Kong Game & Watch? Well now that thing's gonna have to hand over the title of oldest thing in my collection to a new contender. Yup, this is the Color TV Game 15. I've collected one of every Nintendo console at this point, it was inevitable that I tried to seek this one out. Most Nintendo fans probably know about this system from a passing mention as being one of the earliest Nintendo consoles predating the NES. Well, that would be correct. Some people might debate about it not being the first overall video game product from them, but this baby dates all the way back to 1977. So definitely before all their widely recognizable products. The first generation of video game consoles was really the Wild West, with some early hits such as Pong. Yeah, everyone just basically copied Pong. But hey, I'm not gonna blame them, that was the technology at the time. It was already a miracle to get shapes you can move around on a TV screen. What folks may not know though is that the Magnavox Odyssey, the first ever home console, actually predated the original Pong arcade game, which took inspiration from mid instead of the other way around. This led in turn to Magnavox and Atari having some legal kerfuffles and now every company who wanted to make Pong clones had to license it from Magnavox, including Nintendo. Now Nintendo at that time was still mainly a toy company, they didn't have much experience with video games yet. So they worked with Mitsubishi Electronics to produce them. The first version of the Color TV game was the Color TV Game 6, released on June 1, 1977. The 6 stood for the number of Pong variants that were included in the console. Then just a week later, the Color TV Game 15 came out. These two basically shared the exact same internals except one was programmed to have more games accessible out of the box and so for more. That is a big brain move right there. The most notable difference in form factor between the two versions of the game are the detachable controllers on the 15. They're still hardwired of course, but this definitely reminds me a lot of the Famicom's design with its similarly wired controllers. I'd also like to mention that this whole thing is made from plastic. Now there are a few major scuffs and scratches on my unit as to be expected from a used item from the 70s, but overall it looks fine from a distance and if it was any cleaner, I probably would have had to pay a heck of a lot more for it. The middle of the unit houses a bunch of switches that can change settings, such as the slider that switches between game modes. If you have a keen eye, you might have noticed that there's only 8 games on this list instead of 15. Well, there's a switch that toggles between single and doubles play, and 7 of the games can be played in these two modes, which add up to 15 games in total. Yep, that's how marketing gets ya. So, getting this thing hooked up properly was an interesting experience. On the power side, this thing can take either 6 c size batteries or use a power adapter. It did come with the original power adapter, but I can't use it due to voltage differences. Thankfully, it has the same specifications as those for the Famicom and Sega Genesis, so that's not a big hassle. What is a big hassle though is the video connection. Being from the 70s, this thing only outputs composite video through RF, or radio frequency, which is usually only used on old television sets. Normally the thing would have come with an RF switch, but whoever used the system before me modified it into a coaxial plug that didn't fit my CRT television, and even with an adapter led to a super messy signal because the thing was basically falling apart and exposing on a bare wire so I had to rewire it into the adapter itself, it's a long story. But basically, now I can just plug it into my CRT's antenna input because analog TV is already dead, turn it on and manually search for the signal itself. And there it is. So the first thing I tried is to make sure the knob controllers were functioning, and uh, this is weird. So you know how the knob controls are supposed to give you analog control over the position of the paddles? Yeah, that's not the case here. Turning the knob here only makes the paddle go up and down at a fixed speed. You can just hold it there and the paddle will keep moving, eventually wrapping around the screen. And notice how I can barely twist it and it still registers as movement. For all intents and purposes, this can be replaced with two directional buttons and it wouldn't make a difference. Turns out this is only a quirk with the first model of the system. Nintendo would later produce a second more common model that's tinted in reddish orange and would feature actual analog knobs that can't be turned continuously. So this unit here is slightly gimped, but it's cool to know that this is a less common variant. After testing that both controllers work, you can go ahead and adjust the game settings on the panel. The first two switches control the size of each paddle as a handicap of sorts. The first switch changes the speed of the ball, between normal and insane. This is not designed to be played with paddles that move at fixed speeds. The fourth switch is the aforementioned toggle between singles and doubles, which just makes an additional paddle appear on each side. Once you finish setting up and choosing your game mode, you just press the green reset button to start the game. I think 99% of people watching this video already know how Pong works. Here, the first 1 to 15 points wins, so to speak. Let's just go over each of the 8 variants from top to bottom. 
By the way, there's no computer AI in this game obviously, so I'll be controlling both players because I have no friends. Tennis A features a mesh of dots in the middle of the screen that can occasionally deflect the ball. That is, if you don't leave the ball bouncing back and forth in a straight line because this game is pretty simplistically programmed. You can get the ball stuck in the boundaries if you tried hard enough. Tennis B is just regular Pong without obstacles. The line in the middle is just for show. Kinda feels like these two should be switched around. Also, because all the game settings are done through the panel, you can just change modes mid-game, no one's stopping you. Hockey A adds in some vertical walls on each player's goal, as well as a wall in the middle with a piece in the center that seems to randomly appear and disappear whenever the ball hits something, it's pretty weird. Hockey B just removes the middle wall and makes it pong with extra borders. Though if you turn on doubles mode, instead of the extra paddle appearing next to your own, it appears on the opponent's side instead. Kind of like a game of foosball, which can admittedly be pretty fun at times. Volleyball A looks very similar to tennis aside from the sick color change, but it does work slightly differently. In tennis, the dots in the center can only reflect the ball vertically, while in volleyball, they're able to reflect them horizontally back at you as well, keeping you on your toes. Volleyball B uses the same single line as tennis B, but instead of being a background decoration, the line can actually reflect the ball vertically. Other than that, it's tennis but purple. Next up is Ping Pong, and uh, I kinda get what they were trying to go for here, trying to replicate a side view of a ping pong table, but the physics here are still regular Pong. That's not how table tennis works. This is just Pong but with a wall on the bottom. Whatever, moving on. And finally, we have Shooting Game. This one's a little weird if you don't know what's going on, since this isn't a Pong variation. In this one, the left paddle has to manually fire a ball at the right paddle by pressing the red button on the console but the right paddle is constantly blinking in and out. The score on the left represents the number of times the ball has been fired. If the ball hits the right paddle, then the screen flashes red and the score on the right goes up. I imagine there can be multiple ways to play this game, including just trying to hit the static target as much as possible with correct timing, or making it a more competitive game by controlling the paddles. The manual even recommends changing the size of the right paddle for some additional challenge. Now I personally just have the ball speed set to high, trying to hit a continuously moving and blinking target, it is almost impossible. But that is it for the Color TV Game 15. What more do you expect? It's a Pong clone from 1977 that just so happens to have Nintendo's name on it. While I do still find it interesting to try out given that it's one of their very first home consoles, I think it's safe to say that their later products like the Game & Watch and early arcade games had a larger significance on shaping the video game giant we know today. Nintendo would call back to the Color TV game series a handful of times in their history, most notably in Smash Bros. and WarioWare. But outside of those, it hasn't been referenced nearly as much as the Game & Watch, and rarely shows up whenever Nintendo does a history lesson and groups other home consoles together. In that way, I can see it as sort of the black sheep of major Nintendo consoles. I said major. It may be derivative of other products of the era, but the Color TV game series is still a successful first step into the home console industry, and extremely influential in terms of Nintendo's own history. Shigeru Miyamoto's first job at Nintendo was to design the casing for one of the Color TV game consoles. So it is fascinating to imagine an alternate history where this console never happened that Nintendo could have entered the video game industry in a completely different way, or maybe even not at all. The butterfly effect, folks, it's weird to think about. But for now, it's cool to have a new piece of old Nintendo history in my collection. It's neat to learn about all aspects of Nintendo history, so maybe in the future I might even try finding some of their toy era products. Provided they're not insanely priced and are actually good set pieces because I don't want to just hoard stuff I'm running out of space. That's a bit of a me problem, isn't it? Wow. This really happened. What? <laughs> Amazing. Can't believe this game, dude. <laughs>